you get a F5? Can I change? Hi, everyone. How you get a F5? So, um, I'm really happy to be here. My name is Alan Akikule. Um, I'm a scientist at um, EY. Um, and that means I you know, work in different domains, use machine learning to help uh, businesses solve their problems. Um, so, today, I'll be speaking about how to build interpretable machine learning models or available machine learning models, if you like. Um, <coughs> So we have about uh, one hour together. So I'm going to try to keep this uh, the talk like for five minutes and leave 15 minutes for you to ask questions. Please ask questions as much as you like. I, you can always talk me in the middle of my um, talk if you think I'm going too fast or if you have a specific question you ask. So this next slide, please. Um, so I don't have a finger, so she's my finger. So this is my talk outline, right? So I'm going to introduce a few concepts, um, talk about what interpretability is. Um, we'll look at um, some things called intrinsically interpretable models. Um, and also, also consider some things called post hoc interpre interpretation methods. Um, and also look at a particular type of interpre interpretation method called um, live. And then we're going to use a demo. So introduction, next slide. Cool. So I am assuming a lot of things in this um, in this talk. I assume all of you are familiar with machine learning. You know what supervisor is. You know what supervisor. And I do not want to go. This is not a talk for you know going into the concepts of machine learning. You should be already familiar with these things. Um, so we already know that machine learning algorithms. You build the model, right? That's essentially what we're trying to do. Machine learning. You have a training data. You know, you fit into it, um, machine learning algorithm, and then you have a training model, right? Or machine learning model. That's basically that you use for the inference or the prediction at the end of the day. Um, so your model is basically a mathemat mathematical representation of what you are trying to build, right? Um, so it's a mapping from your training data, training data or your training set, your X, to your Y. Um, so it's, it's as simple as that, really. Um, so there are two your, your, there are two types of models, basically. Um, you have something called the black box models, and on the other hand, the white box. Um, and I'm very sure a lot of you are very familiar with neural networks, you know, CNS, RNS. Uh, I know you guys have a bit more neural networks so much. Um, so yeah, there are definitely black box, black box models. Like, can anyone tell me um, that you understand what the parameters are the neural networks mean? Like, there are billions of them, you can't. They do not make sense, right? For the most part. So that's why the way those parameters work together, the interpretation of them, are not very clear to me. And that's why they are called the black box models, because you can't look into them and actually see how they come about their decision. So on the other hand of that spectrum, right, are the white box models. And those are the ones where you can actually look into them. They are very simple. If you look at parameters, they make sense to you, like they make sense to humans. Um, an example of those ones are, you know, your very unfancy methods, like people do not like to use your linear regressions, your logistic regressions, your SVMs. Um, so, yeah. Introducing all those quick concepts because it's really helpful going into the talk. Next slide, please. I will be talking about interpretability now. So next slide. Um, so it's like a bunch of you know definitions people in the industry that um, academia have been able to come up with. Um, and the first one is from a guy called Tim Miller. And he basically says interpretability is the degree to which the human can understand the cause of a decision, right? So what you're saying is, all right, how, how, to, to what degree can I understand what this guy is saying? Like this model, I built it. So to what degree can I understand it? Is it does, do I know why it's making sense in nature? Because that's very important. And we'll, we'll talk about why it's important to actually be able to interpret the results of machine learning methods. Um, and also the second one is interpretability is the degree to which a human can consistently predict the model's results. So if you know that if you do certain things, right, your model will predict a certain results. Then you have to set confidence in you know, your model, like, okay, I actually trust, I know how the internal you know, dynamics of the model works. Um, next slide, please. Right, so um, this is a spectrum I uh, basically created. And you have three things here. You have the model interpretability, the model complexity, and the prediction performance, right? You notice that on this side, you have more interpretable models. 
And as you go to the right side, you have less interpretable entities. Right? So this it's not binary, it's not, it's not like you have one of the interpretable and some other ones. It's not binary, it's like a spectrum, like it's a continuum. So what you find is that the less complex a model is, the more interpretable it tends to be. And that's why you have your linear regressions. They are very simple, right? Yeah, you can look at them there, and understand what's going on here. And the more complex they go, you know, the more layers you start onto your neural networks, the more complex it becomes, and the less interpretable it becomes because you have billions of parameters. The parameter space basically blows, blows up. And it also makes sense that um, you know, less complex models are not stable. Performance, and that's why we we have this very strong um, class of models that we use for our images. They are very very complex, um, and that's why they're usually more performant. But as we lose interpretability, and they're more complex. So this spectrum just basically lets you see how you know the trade-off between interpretability, complexity, and then performance. Next, please. So this is a. I spend all my time on Twitter for those that know me. Um, and this is a video I actually found very funny. So if you could play this, then I'll tell you why I decided to put this into this. Okay. Kind of play this. If you can't do this. Part of your uh, driving test. You see an old man and a young kid. What do you hit? Um, the old man? Well, I mean, the, the kid has his whole life ahead of him. So, I would hit the old man, right? The brakes. You'd hit the brakes. <laughs> the kid? <laughs> so I thought that was a very funny video called, you didn't hear it. No. All right, so basically it says, you did not hear it. Oh, we, I wish we had to speak today. So basically, um, that puppet, or whatever it is, um, was going through his uh, final driving test. And the driving instructor was asking him, or her, whatever it is, what, so if you, if you have a, if you see an old man, and um, the young girl, children will eat. Um, and he was like, oh yeah, the old man, because the old man has, like, you know, I think, because the old man has really been, like, the young guy still has, like, I don't know. So I thought that was very funny. It was funny, but then I'm like, Think of you know the kind of models, the kind of you know whatever you want to call it, AI you have the world and where you are self-driving car and all that. Imagine if you could ask your self-driving car that question, right? And then your self-driving car told you, "Oh, I hate your grandfather." Would you not be like, "Oh my God, I can't trust you," right? Mm -hmm. And that was, I thought it was really interesting. Uh, just click on the page. Right, and now to what I said, so why do we really care about interpretability? I mean, if you have models that, are, that give us very high predictive performances, you know, you, you run the model, you have an accuracy of 99%, you're like, oh my god, I've done the greatest thing in the world. Why do we still care about making them interpretable? Um, because a lot of people don't, don't understand why that's, that's important. And for a lot of reasons, it's because of ethical and legal reasons. There are certain domains like healthcare, um, where you want to know why your model is basically making a decision right? You want to know if, if you have a model that predicts cancer or not cancer, right? You want to be able to tell the person, like, oh, wait, the reason we, we think you have cancer is because this, 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 that, 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 right? Um, legal reasons is if you think about what's happening in the world, right? let, let's use the US as an example. Uh, we know that there's a lot of, you know, US, the US is a very racially polarized country. If a black person goes into a bank to ask for a deal or something, you want to know if the model is not being discriminatory. Right? You want to know, okay, actually, why is that being predicting, rejecting my own application as a black person? So it's important for the domains like that to be able to be transparent about the results of the model. Um, social acceptance and trust. Uh, the analogy I made mean about the self driving car, it's very important as we start having these models embedded into our daily lives. We need, to be, we need people to socially accept them. Right? If you can trust the decision of the model, it's not just black or white. It's not. I mean, we don't see God. A lot of people don't even believe, really believe in God, right? So if you have a black box, black box, <coughs> that just tells you, you know what? This is the decision I made. And you cannot really explain why you made that decision. 
it will be very hard for you to trust that kind of model. So it is very important to have interpretable models for social acceptance and for trust. Um, and the last, one of the last reasons for auditing and debugging purposes. So if your model is, okay, for example, that guy that wanted to hit your grandfather, that's obviously important. You don't want to hit your grandfather. You want to step on, you step on the brakes, right? So if you, you, you tell your model to tell you, oh, why did you make that decision? And it tells you, oh, because I think your grandfather is already old. He died and he's dead, so you just kill him. And you're like, no, I don't want that to happen. Let me be bored. I need to do some other things to make sure that outcome is not the outcome of this. Um, so yes, so we've talked about you know um, the reasons why you know why interpretability is important, um, why we care about it, um, and now we're going to start. We're going to talk about intrinsically interpretable models. If you go to the next slide, please. Oh, so the easiest way to actually achieve interpretability is to use um, models that actually inherently produce interpretable models. I know you don't like to hear that, uh, but it's the truth. Like, use models like logistic regressions, uh, which actually works very well in a lot of cases um, are found. Um, and decision trees do not work very well. We know why. Right? I'm not going to go into the reason why it doesn't work very well. But this model actually inherently, in their structure, produce interpretable models. I'll give you a story, logistic regression. I always tell people the story. Uh, when I was doing my masters, uh, there was a big bank that came to our class to talk to us. Um, one of the biggest banks. And they came and they were like, yeah, they use the logistic regression model to actually um, do the application process. So they don't use anything fancy, like fancy by people's definition of that is. Um, it's a simple logistic regression model. And at that point, I did not understand why they were using logistic regression. But now I understand that they need the results of um, you know, the models that are um, interpreted for people and for audit purposes. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please. So quickly, I'll just quickly brush through this. You know what? A linear regression, we have this, you have, you have one of assumptions. This is the simplest thing you can, you can actually have. It models the relationship between the outcome, which is the y, and the target variable, and the, feature, and the features as a linear combination of very simple, just there. Um, and then the E you have there, the error term, the epsilon term, which is um, you know how much you know error is between the uh, mean of the population and then the instance you have. So you have a bunch of assumptions, and it's very easy to interpret because you have those beta terms, right? And the way you interpret that is so um, do you have a pair of views? So if you have um, y hat equals to beta 1, beta 1, x1, b, So you have this, uh, this are obviously your feature, right? And this is your um, target. And this is the regression, this is the regression, this is the regression. So you have this is the intercept. Um, and these are your feature weights. It's very easy to interpret this because you just need to look at this and be like, oh, okay. If this feature is a numeric feature, it just basically means that one increase, a one unit increase in this feature value means the outcome will increase by, by this means. Very simple, right? So if you have a y has equals to 150 x1 plus 2 x2 x. So we're saying if this increases by one unit, this outcome will increase by very simple, straightforward. The problem with this is it makes a lot of assumptions. It's linear. You cannot model very complex relationships. And that is why you don't have very, very good predictive performance with it. The logistic regression is also very simple. I'm not going to go over that. Um, but yeah, the logistic regression models the relationship between the um, feature value, the features, and um, probability as a you use something called the logic function, or which is called the thing function. There's a, I wrote a blog post about it, you're interested in learning about it more. Um, but these are two of the simplest interpretable models we have um, on the market. So, so we've spoken about intrinsically interpretable models. Uh, they are not fancy, but it's what we have. Um, we 
you know. So the next thing we're going to talk about now is post hoc, inter post -hoc interpretation methods. So basically, what are what are these things? Um, so they are model agnostic methods. By model agnostic, you mean you apply them to any type of model. That's that's why that's how that feels. Um, and you apply them to models after you train your after you train your model. And then yeah, we have loads of them. A lot of a lot of people are beginning to do a lot of very good things in, in literature with these things. Um, but I decided to pick just a few of them. We won't have time, unfortunately, to go to go through all of them because each of them is you know you could read papers and then go into that. Um, but the ones we're going to talk about today is the, the second one, the global interpretable model agnostic explanation. I'm sure, has anybody heard about Lime here? I don't know if you're about the talking about Lime. Lime, right? Just two hands. Cool. They're good. Um, so we're going to learn something new today. So the first one is the global surrogates, the local interpretable model agnostic explanations, the sharply additive explanations, um, individual conditional ex expectation. Permutation feature of importance. There are tons of resources on, on each of these methods online. We are only going to focus on the second one. Well, I think it would be useful for me to explain the first one, which is called global surrogate, because then it will help you understand the second one, which is also a type of surrogate method. So, does anybody understand, uh, obviously, I think you all understand the concepts of surrogates here. Right? Um, the Kardashian family actually, Kim Kardashian, our last show, I mean, our last show was two years right? Well, she basically paid someone to have the baby part because it was too hard for her. So the concept of a surrogate basically is um, so the concept of a surrogate is you have a function here, right? I'll call this function x, right? This function is very complex, very um, difficult to evaluate. Like it's, it's very unwieldy. You don't understand. It's hard to manage, right? So instead of actually computing this function itself, you are supposed to something a small a, a less complex. This guy is less. So this is actually what Kim Kardashian did, right? She was like, oh my god, pregnancy is too much. Let me just give it someone something less complex. The only thing she had to do was pay some money, right? Well, money don't work with pay. We are talking about you know computational expense here. Um, so the idea of that basic idea is sort of instead of computing it expensive right. we use a more uh, a less complex um, function to actually approximate this guy. Now but then the thing is the problem is with sort of it is you have there are more, many many types of functions that actually approximate this one, right? So there's a class, there's a set of possible um, surrogate methods you can use to actually approximate this guys. Or to approximate this guy. So you need to you need you need a measure to actually find how well does this guy actually approximate this guy. That makes sense, right? Because yeah, there's a there's a whole set of them you can use. So global surrogate is the idea that you're just looking for one function that directly approximates this guy. It's usually very hard, and I'll tell you why. Imagine you have your, you know, your, let's say, CNN, right? You're very complex on it. You have, like, whatever number of years, you have six years, right? You have a billion of parameters, right? It will be very hard for you to find a simpler model, yeah, that would, that would have approximate this function from. Because inherently, this model is just too complex. And if you want to approximate it, you also need something that's almost as complex as it. Right? Um, so, and that's the idea behind the global surrogates. So, the next one we're going to talk about now is the local interpretable model agnostic explanation. And it's called local. You, so, keep in mind that this is called local. And the other one we said is the global. Next uh, slide. Perfect. So, like I said, this is global. So the local surrogate models are used to explain the individual prediction of a black box model. Now this is this is very important. Yeah. And I want I want to make sure people understand this before I move to the next slide. 
which is used to understand the individual prediction of a black box model. Can people see this? No. No? Now? Perfect. Um, right. So I think it is used to explain individual predictions of a black box model. It's very important. That individual prediction is very important because the global, the global model, you, you use it to basically approximate the whole function itself, the whole black box model. This one, you're not, use, you're not trying to use it to explain the whole black box model. You're trying to explain just an individual prediction. Like, imagine if you're building a loan, um, a loan application. I like using loan application because I like, I like money. So, you walk into a bank, right? And um, you want to explain to someone why you know, the person was rejected. You don't, you, don't, you don't care about what the model does in the grand scheme of things. You only care about why that, that model makes that particular decision, right? That's single interest. And that's why we use, that's why the always are given. For example, one of them in mind. That's why we use that. Um, so basically, this is your, this is your uh, black box model. This is your in input field, right? This is the new input field. What you want to approximate is actually this. I want to use F3 k conditions, and this is G. What I'm saying is, this is your black box model, right? We are trying to approximate. This guy, this new surrogate level, which is local, and you want it to be as good as possible to this guy. All right, thank you. So how does line do that? If you look at the screen here, you can see that the decision surface for this complex model we built. It looks quite complex. Right? It looks like this. Uh, you have this. You know, it's it's a binary classification problem. The blue dots and then the red crosses. And then you have that very complex decision of this. It's very complex. Um, and then instead of trying to approximate the whole decision of it, so what we want to do is approximate, uh, actually use it to explain the prediction of that dark red cross, the, the bold one. So how does line do this? Do you understand what I'm saying so far? Do you, does somebody want me to go back? Or if you don't get to this, this just, uh, I like I like interactive classes. Does it make sense? Huh? That's why I said. See, listen. It's I want to I want us to get something out of it, so it will make sense. If, you know. So please stop me. I don't I don't mind. Do you want me to go right again? Yeah. From from which part? Line. I thought I thought you were sleeping. I was like, oh, I'm filled. <laughs> Okay, so tell me what, what did you understand about it? What? After the After the All right, cool. So I think I was talking about the surrogate model, right? Yeah. And that was where it got confusing. All right, let me start again. So I was talking about global surrogates. And the idea is you have a model, you have a function. Because essentially what I said is models are functions, right? They are just basically mappings from one from your um, input space into your output space. That, that's what they are. Um, but a lot of them are actually very complex to evaluate. Like your neural networks, because they are very huge. And their decision boundaries are actually very complex, right? So you have this, right? But you want something that is Less complex because according to that spectrum, I uh, could you go back a few, a few slides to that spectrum slide? Not yet. That one. You want something more interpretable, and obviously, if it's more interpretable, it tends to be less complex, right? And that's the idea. Also. So this guy is complex, um, less interpretable. Kim Kardashian, I've seen you more, it's not looking down. <laughs> I'm explaining it because of it. So you have, you have this complex and um, less interpretable model, right? And you want something simpler, right? 
less complex, more interpretive. Thank you. So you want to see, this guy is going to be the surrogate of this. We are not going to use this guy because it's too, it's too difficult to it. We can't, we can't explain it. So we want something that's as close as possible to it, right? That's not as complex, right? But that's as close as possible, not as complex, but that is easy to interpret or easier to interpret than this guy because easy to interpret is. Interpretability is very subjective. Something that's interpretable to you might not be to me. I mean, therefore, it doesn't seem, it doesn't make sense. But anyway, so you want something that's less complex to replace this guy, right? And this is the idea behind the global service. So energy, I get behind sort of this um, um, general is you substitute something for something, something less complex. Does that make sense now? Yeah. That there's a trade-off between interpretability and then performance. Because do you understand, do you understand what I mean? Yeah. My, my point is if you have if you have your if you have your neural network, like you have your points like this, right? Then you have the you have the socket that looks like this, right? This guy is very it's a very good fit. Your accuracy on this one will probably be 99% or something like that, right? But you want to relax if you don't want to, it's like your regularization parameter in your uh, maybe classification models. You lose interpretability for some other form, for maybe you lose your performance for interpretability. So everything in machine learning, almost everything is a trade-off. You have to think, do I want more of this or less of that? Right? So does that make sense to you now? Yeah. Thank you. More questions? I was planning to work out the late comments, but thank you. <laughs> Um, so cool. That makes sense to you now, right? Perfect. So, um, surrogacy all sorted. Now let's go back to the local interpretive work must be Cool. So as I was saying, I said the, the challenge with global surrogacy is that because the guy is already very complex, right? It's hard for you to find um, a global a function that is a that's as close to it, that would be simple. It's, imagine, could, could someone think of uh, something that would be simple enough to replace a CNN, for example? Like, I can't think of anything, right? Um, it's, it's just really hard. And that's the challenge in global surveys because it's really hard to find a, uh, a global surveys that is interpretive. And that's why I started thinking of global interpretability, like using local surrogate methods. And I'll explain what local surrogate methods are. Please stop me if you think I'm going too fast. Or, um, so the reason I'm asking you to tell me is because I'm evaluated on this because people are going to pay me my choice if you don't understand this. So I'll joke. So cool. Right, so I was talking about LIME. So LIME is one of those methods. Um, it's called Local Interactive Model Agnostic Explanation. Let's break it down. Local Model Agnostic Interpretable, we don't care about it. Interpretable um, Explanation type. Explanation. These are keywords I want us to um, pay attention to. Model agnostic, right? Agnostic means you can use it for, like, it, it's not tied to a particular type of model, right? So you can use it for all classes of models, and it's work. Local, because it is local versus. Right? So local because you do not actually have, you don't have, you don't have a global function that basically replaces your, your very expensive to compute method, right? What you do in this case is you only care about, you don't care about everything in the model. You only care about why it predicts this particular instance. So we care about one instance. Does that make sense? Hmm? 
We don't care about them, we only care about that one. And then how do we how do we turn it to explain the result of that? So I was talking about this, right? You understand this? Does anybody understand? I mean, ignore this dashed line here, but just the blue part and then the white part that are very screen. Do people understand that? Cool. So that looks like a very complex vision surface, right? It looks like, you know, it's, it really fits, really tries to fit the data very well. It's very good. Um, but then, so we have someone that's also, you know, someone invited you, the startup in the US invited you to help them do their credit risk modeling um, app or, or two, and you build that, and then you want to explain the result, the result of one. So how do I do this? You basically take, so in that instance, you care about, let's call it X. Right? Um, that is how you care about this one index. So what I do is it generates many instances that are close to X. It generates a new data set of instances that are close to this X, right? And that's why it's called local because you know that I think about them. It only picks that that single that single instance and then generates more. So because you want to see how the model will be able to enable of that instance pair box. Does that make sense? Cool. Yeah. Um, so that's the only thing pair box. It generates a lot of uh, a lot of uh, instances that are similar to our X, and then it picks a new model that is simpler to use and that's simpler to interpret in that new approach. Right. And then it does, and then you'll be able to interpret that. And then you know, okay, this is why this is behaving this way. That. Um, so, local surrogacy models have something called local fidelity. I'm not talking about the bank, I'm talking about you know, fidelity in the sense that. Okay, now I'll, I'll do something on, on the board again. I like drawing. I like writing. So, imagine you have a X1. And this is the <laughs> this is my application problem, right? Okay. Well let's imagine, let's let's assume you have maybe so. Let's assume this guy is a complex model, right? So what we want to do is we want to use instead of finding a method that approximates this whole decision surface, we only care about this guy. So what line does is it gives this guy, right, and then generates a new data set of instances that are very close to this guy. Right? And then you use a very simple model to just classify them. And then because you have a simpler model in that region, it's easier to manage, right? So it's like let me give you an example. Um, the problem of Nigeria is complex, it's like okay, so let's use this. Nigeria is a very um, complex place. Right? Mm -hmm. If you want to solve your problems in Nigeria, I don't think why can solve them. It's hard to find a global story, right? um, even if you are in this desert. But it's, it's hard to find um, a global story, right? But it is easier for you if you want to change your, if you want to change things, if you want to explain things, it's easier for you to go to your locality, right? Your, your local government, right. and change things there. Because there it's more controllable, it's more, it's not, it's not as unwieldy as in a global space. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. But I'm happy you love that. Um, so it has something called local fidelity, and fidelity means the approximation in that local space is, is as good as possible. Right. Perfect. Um, so this is the nicest thing you're going to see. The next thing coming up is for me. Please. Excuse me. something about fidelity. Make sure the similarity or yes, yes. You have how this is like how well it is like like a loss function. Yeah. That's the ugliness. But it is not that ugly. So what for it? So what this is is um, so you have you know a bunch of ugly looking mathematical symbols. The X again is our instance, right? That's what we're trying to explain. Not as many as we're trying to explain. Um, and you have, you know, we are trying to minimize the function L. Right? You're very familiar, I, I believe everybody's familiar with that's ARG. So it's, it's what you, you are saying you want to minimize the function. 
we are all families. We, we, we all very familiar with prayer uh, decent, right? So if I say if this, if we believe that that's right, and this, and this is the function of death, and this is the function of this death, we could do something like add me F theta. We'll just say we are looking for the parameters, the value of theta that he minimizes this surface. And that's it. So, uh, because I find, what I found in, in, in literature is people use all this complex um, you know, notation to actually explain what they mean. And it gets people when in fact they are quite simple. Um, so, you, you have two components of this. Does the last part look familiar to anyone? Does it not look like the regularization parameter? Like in, in doing you know, the other regularization and all that? Does that make sense? No. It does, right? Please, can you? I like it. I like that. Can I tell you the reality? Yeah. It's more academic. It's more academic. <laughs> well, that was, uh, it was supposed to be, actually. It was supposed to be. But we're going, no, no, we're going into, uh, there's going to be a demo after this. Um, and that's it. So we start from the demo. So <laughs> 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 we can't do that. So, okay, so this class, like, it contains uh, people from data science class and mm -hmm. ML class mm -hmm. also. Some people do not have any idea about ML. Oh. And yeah, it's from data science class, that's why. Oh, okay, so I'm, 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 I have a little about that. I made an assumption that um, because that AI is something that's yeah, why I expected. That was why I said, I, that was why I had to put that happy at the start. Like, I, I see people already know what's provided. Um, so actually, the plan is, I plan to actually write a blog post in detail about it. So you can read that, and that will help you. But please just try to follow up. Yeah, I'm trying. I will have that correct, please. Well, do I have people following me? Yes. So, please, yeah, thank you. So, um... <laughs> <laughs> How well does this approximation 
actually approximates the more we're trying to do in that locality. Right? Because like in everything machine learning, you want to make sure you are actually fitting your training sets properly. And that's why you have the concept of loss function, right? So see this as a loss function, it's actually a loss function. Right? Because you use it to then pick from a class of interpretable models you could use, you are going to pick one that you think fits the, that new data set as best as possible. Um, so your question, the question you asked before, um, uh, what's your name? Like the question you asked before, Lady, is you said there's a there's a trade-off between fidelity and interpretability, which is as you move towards the less interpretable side, you you are going to lose some fidelity, you are going to lose fits because you know as you move towards the less interpretable, you tend to use less complex models because they tend to be less interpretable, or more interpretable. Right? So it, it's a trade-off like in everything, um, and it's. One of the most um, famous traders in machine learning is who knows that? Bias variance. It's, it's, it's what it is. You have to do with bias variance trade off. There is a trade off everywhere in machine learning. Um, even in the real life, there's a trade off between you sleeping, you know, 24 hours a day and playing around, um, or you just uh, making money. It depends on what you want to do, you know, make, moving out of your life. And the same thing in machine learning. Um, so, yes, I, I, I think. So the um, omx, omega x rather, um, measures the complexity. Go oh, please. Example we are going to actually use, we are going to see how it helps you um, see that uh, overfitting the data. Uh, so we get into that in, uh, I think people are more interested in that, so I'll try to move away from it. But it's quite important to understand. So the complexity, because um, you have a, like multiple options when you're trying to use an interactive model. You use your, the if it's a classification model, you use your decision trees, you use FEM, you use your discretion. So it, and each of them have different complexities. So you also want to choose an interpretable model that is not as complex as possible. Because interpretable models are called interpretable, but they can also get very complex. Right? If you are fitting a decision tree, the depth of your tree determines the complexity. Right? You could keep splitting it until it overfits the data set. Um, so cool, we are almost done and we'll get into what people came here for, which is the demo. So um, next slide. There are a few copy I think we need to really talk about. The name of which is this guy I told you about. It's actually quite hard to define. Sorry? The bias, yes. Um, do you want to go back, please? So yes, which is, you know. So, and that's, you, you select the neighborhood, you, you pick new instances around that neighborhood, and then you fit a similar model in that neighborhood, uh, just in that neighborhood, and then you see what the results are. So, and that, Pi x determines how far apart. So it's also a parameter in this, in this new thing. Um, so it's very hard to define. Currently, um, the line library in Python, which is what we're using, uses something called the exponential smoothing kernel. Um, and kernel methods, I don't know if anybody's familiar with it, is you use, you take, it takes two data points and actually measure the distance between them. Um, so if you use um, okay, I'm going to throw it to the audience now. Uh, could anyone tell me like two distance um, calculation methods we have in machine learning? Like, sorry, what's going on? Linear. Okay, good. Yep, another one. <coughs> what? Linear. Yeah, yeah, we have, we have loads of them. It depends on your use case, man. You can use any one of them. So, um, also the sampling could be improved. Currently, in mind, the one we currently use in mind. Because right now, it does in the funny way that's not very well. By something, I mean how it picks this new instance that are close to this guy we're trying to do. It will be improved. Well, keep in mind that this is a new field. Well, it's green field. It's really improving by the day. There's a lot of research going into this place. Uh, people are really interested in it. So a lot of things are going to change in the next few years. Um, we're going to have better, better methods of actually doing this. So the main the goal of this talk basically was to introduce this thing and to, to let people go home have something to um, also research about. 
So the complexity of the explanation model has to be defined in, in advance. The reason is you have to determine, for example, if you are using um, a linear regression model as your know, simple model, right? You have to tell it, oh, this has the number of features that I actually care about, whether it's six, whether it's five. So it's, it's very subjective, right? And um, that's, that's not very good. We don't like too much subjectivity in machine learning. Um, so that is very good, because we have some time to then go into the demo. It's fine. All right, so I'll go there. And then we use the last one too. So you only care about you. You only care about that instant care about that. More questions? Is it a model for us or a model It's a model for us. Yeah, it's a model for us. Um, any other question? Cool. So let's do this. Someone to pray because demos usually never run the way you expect them to. Um, have you seen this? Have you seen this? Oh, so um, first thing you need to do with uh, this guy is to actually install Lime. It, that's the library I'm going to use in Python, right? It's, um, So I like to use, it's always a good idea to, to use, you know, um, virtual environments. So I always, I always recommend this. And then first thing you need to do is install Lime, right? I've already installed it because I wasn't, I don't trust the internet. I was, I was not going to trust the internet yet. Um, so it's already installed, but then, you know, you go through that process. Um, and then, what we want to do now is, we are going to fit a uh, text classification model. We're going to use um, random forest. Random forests are very hard to um, interpret, right? We all know that. The only thing we get in random forest is something called the feature importance, right? Yeah. And in a lot of cases, it doesn't really tell you, what, what, do you know what those numbers mean when it tells you this is 0 0.4 or 0, it doesn't, it doesn't really make sense, right? So we are going to use line to actually explain the result of a particular model, of a particular instance. So we are, um, here we're using, we're importing line, right? Uh, also importing numpy, I don't think we need it anymore. Um, so I'm going to use one of the scikit learn, um, one of the data sets available directly within scikit learn. Um, this one is called fetch 20 news group. Has anybody used this before? No? So basically it's a data set, um, it was short, so it's, it's, a, it's a news group data set, and it's, a, it's used by NLP uh, researchers. It's very simple to use. And basically, you have documents that were crawled from a news group website, so it's like a discussion forum or something like that, right? And uh, each of those you know, documents, they have like an assigned category. So there are a lot of categories. You have, um, so, let me get that for you. So you have a lot of categories, you have, not this one. Right, so these are all the categories you have. So you know, oops. So you have, you have category on graphics, you know, for autos, motorcycles, electronics, whichever one. So you have, it's, a, it's usually used for multi-cluster, right? But to simplify things, you're going to use, use it for 
binary classification uh, problem. So I'm importing some things. I'm using TFID as a vectorizer. Everybody is familiar, well, most people are familiar with that, right? No? Yes? No? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, the people that said yes, you teach people that said no. <laughs> um, and then we have uh, an ensemble. We are going to use the random forest classifier, right? And the metric we are going to use to measure the fit is an F1 score. We all know. I think everyone should know what an F1 score is, right? Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. No, okay. Um, again, people that know it should teach people that know it. <laughs> um, so you also have, well, I'm going to use, I'm going to make use of something called psychic length pipelines. If you haven't used them before, if you use psychic length and you don't use pipelines, you should start using them. They are extremely amazing. So like I said, I am only going to use two categories. Um, I chose two categories, electronics and autos, like automobiles, automobiles, um, cars. So those are two categories. And I am you know, trying to get a training set and test set. So what I have here is, you know, it's just basically pass this parameter called the subsets, tell it whether it's a training set or a test set. Um, and then you pass the categories you want, which are just two things I want to write. And, uh, so, and that's it. Cool. So now I have my, let's see how this goes. You see, this guy, it's very, it's just text, NLP stuff, right? It's not, it's not structured, it's not tabular, like you have it in your, you know, pandas, this is very ugly. Um, so what we do is, because this is not a machine learning class, this is just to introduce accessibility, we are not going to do cleaning and all this, uh, you know, preprocessing we're going to do. We're just going to use it that way. So we use the TFIDF vectorizer. So basically what a vectorizer, what this TFIDF does, for people that don't understand it is, you, your machine learning models don't, they don't use text, they use numbers, right? So you want to find a way to convert those long text into, um, you know, like a vector that you use for your machine learning model. And that's it. So TFIDF is one of those you want to use. Sorry? Converting words for letters. Converting words into No, no, that's not that's all that. Um, so it, it uses, I don't know how to describe it right now because I'm going to start wasting time to describe it. But essentially what it does is it, it does it uses a weighted, so it breaks them into words basically, right? Not letters, because letters will so it breaks them into words and then tries to weight them based on how important they are in the documents and all that kind of stuff. Um, so we have this vectorizer, right? So it turns your text into numbers, vectors, right? And then you have the training vector and then the test vector. And then what I need to use is the feed transform model inside it. Right? So you only need to pass in the training sets, feed transform, and then you use that vectorizer or the thing you use to then transform your test sets. So if I show you what this is now, So it's a sparse matrix, right? A sparse matrix in um, scikit learn or in, in any in any fields, you have a lot of zeros in there, right? And so to save space, it basically compresses it and saves it in this very nice um, structure. I'm not going to go into that because this is also not a linear algebra class. Um, so the next thing we then do is feed a random forest classifier, and I'm using 500 trees, right? That there is no way you would explain you'll be able to go in and know what those, each of those individual trees are doing. There are too many of them. Um, so, and I'll fit it on the training vectors, and then I'll, I'll, I pass in the target, right? If you're training, this is supervised learning. You have your, um, your features and then your targets. So this is training, yep. And the training is done. So, you know, you have the parameters. So the beautiful thing about cycle is it provides very reasonable um, default values. So sometimes you don't even need to worry about things and it just works out of the box. So that's perfect. Um, and then, so I have fixed my model right now. So what do you do after you fit a model? You use it to make predictions, right? Um, and this is what we do. 
So model the predict, and then I pass the test vectors I created into it. Cool. And now I'm like, okay, now I predicted the test. I want to see how well this guy, because your model is useless if it doesn't generalize, right? You want to see how well it actually generalizes to data it wasn't trained on, right? And that's why you test it. Well, you test it on the test set, right? And we're using the F1 score to do this. Now look at the F1 score, this guy is like 90%. This is 0 0.9, this is good, right? You're like, oh, my, my model is doing very well. But then your boss comes in, your boss is like, oh, um, the CEO came and said, why is your model, you know, why is he doing so well? You, he wants you to explain to him what actually contributes to the, you know, this success. And you're like, oh my God, I don't know what to do. And then you came to this talk and we're like, oh, Alan spoke about Lime. And then I can actually use Lime to, you know, sweeten this. So I'm going to use a pipeline. Um, and the pipeline I'm using is, so a pipeline essentially is in scikit-learn, you know, we, in machine learning, you perform a lot of operations. You clean, you, you know, maybe select feature selection, feature extraction, all those things, right? So there are lots of steps. So it's better for you to just lump them together in the pipeline, right? And then because they, they then become reusable. So you could use the same operation you use on your training set, on your test set, without actually having to rewrite a lot of operations on your It helps reduce the amount of code you use. So this is one of the way, uh, one of one way of using pipelines. So I, I'm basically using two um, two things. I'm using the vectorizer I created here, which is the TFID vectorizer, um, and also the model, which is random forest model. So the thing it's going to do is whatever data you pass into this place. It's going to pass it into the vectorizer first, right? And then the result of that goes into the model for your prediction. Um, cool, so I've created that pipeline. And then I'm using that pipeline to then predict, you know, this. I just picked an instance, right? So this news group test data, right, has thousands of, of um, data points. I just picked a random one. You could pick 120 or 120 or whatever. And we're telling it to actually predict the probability of that. Or, you know, we've, we've created a model, right? And we're now using that model to make a prediction. So now we're saying, oh, so it gives us, you know, probabilities. So it's saying the probability of it belonging to, you know, the positive class, which is whether it is, whether the document is an, is, is an auto document, right? it's about auto um, cars or something like that. This is because there are two categories, right? And if you are fitting a binary classification model, you have two categories, like two classes. The other one is the positive class. So this is zero and this is one, right? So what you're trying to find is the probability that um, your instance will be one, right? So it will be equal to this one. So if you come here, it's telling us that the probability is 0 0.63. So it's quite high. So it's telling us that, okay, this, this guy is, uh, the document we have is actually about cars or automobiles. So we still don't know why 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 it's why it told us that it's about to review, right? So we then use and this is why I imported line text. So beautiful about line is you can use it for text, you can use it for tabular data, you can use it for images, whichever one you're interested in. So for example, if I do from line import, it's not working. Ah, cool. So you have your line base, your line image, your line tabular text. So you can use it for different types. I just decided to use text because. Cool, so if you go back in here. So I'm using line text because we're obviously working with text data, right? NLP stuff. Um, and then it has this method called line text explainer. And then you pass in the names of the class. We just renamed it, right? Um, and then I run that, right? So here we've created like that's local surrogate method line as I basically created that. Um, and now what I want to do is I want to so I want to actually explain the result of that particular document. Like why did you tell me this is an auto document? What informed your decision? Right? This is basically so it's the same way when that um, driving instructor asked that guy, like, why did you who would you hit? And he said the grandfather. And you're like, why did you why did you do that? And you explain, you know, it basically explains the decision. The same thing we're trying to do here. So we are telling you to explain this instance. Why is this instance an auto instance? Right? So we use basically we use explain instance method. 
Um, we use that particular instance, which is this guy. Right? We use, you know, this he also uses the prob probability because the probability is is giving us probability. We're trying we're telling it to explain that probability for us. Um, and then we use the number of features. We, I selected this myself six. Because, like I said here, um, you have to select the complexity yourself. And that is the caveat. The complexity of the explanation model has to be defined in advance. It's something you have to choose yourself. Um, cool. So I selected this myself. And I run this. So this is a warning from line, not, not, not a problem really. So what I'm trying to do here is also so I've done this, I've done the explanation, right? Um, and this is just basically printing. So the document ID is 120. The probability that this document is also is 0.63, so it's quite high. So the truth class is actually autos. Right? And then we tell it to explain stuff. So it gives you this list, right? Um, this list of two things. It tells you it uses this text called use, and this is how much effect it has on, on the prediction, right? It also uses the text in, in this guy called line, bin, software, me, article. So it obviously ranks them in order of how important they are. So basically, if, you, if, if I, what should happen is if you remove these two, um, these two texts from the prediction, you should actually remove, you should actually change the probability by that amount. So you're saying this guy contributes 0.03 to the probability. And if you remove it, it will go in the opposite direction. So it's, the probability will start reducing. Like, it's not being as sure as it was before. Um, and this is what basically I did. I just basically summed these two numbers together. Just to, just to prove something. And what I'm doing here is the original, let me actually I'll do this. The original prediction is 0.63, right? Um, and I'll tell you to copy the test vectors, like the particular document I, I want you to do. Um, cool. And I'm not setting, so I'm setting this use in line. I, I'm telling you, you know what? Don't use these two things. And actually, let me see how you behave when I change, you know, when I change the content. And that's why I mentioned about changing. So I'm really manually generating the instances, right? I'm, I'm, I'm perturbing it. I, I'll just something look at the board. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying I have this instance I created. Right? And I want to see how it behaves with another instance if I change some parameters of the text. So I have an X one. So I've changed, I've deleted, when in case of text, I deleted two text, but I think, you know, actually um, predict the most particular function we have. And one of the things I said is the reason we care about interpretability is if you can actually predict how your model will behave if you change things, then it means you can trust it, right? So you can actually reason like it. So that, that, that's, a, that's a positive thing. Um, cool. And that's what I'm trying to do here, because I'm saying that if I remove use and line, the probability should decrease by almost this, like close to this amount. And this is what I'm doing here. So I've set this use and line to zero. So basically the weights don't use them. And I'm now trying to use the, temp, the new thing I created to actually give me a new prediction. So look at this, right? The new prediction, the new probability after re removing these two things is what? 0.59. It's not very far off from 0.06, right? So it tells you that, okay, actually, my the model I've chosen is actually not doing badly in the region, um, you know, in that particular instance. So it's learning some things. And then, so you also have a few um, helper methods you could use to see what, what the decisions look like. This is going to be interesting for a lot of people. So it's telling you that uh, you have this use. This use is contributing 0.03 uh, line. So this basically tells you the low by explanation for that and how each of those steps contributes to, to, um, to the prediction you have. And cool, it tells you, 
you know, and this is just a different way of saying this. Um, it tells you the, pre, um, the probability for auto is 0 0.63, so that's pretty high. Um, and this guy is also the one that is shown here in another way. And this is actually the text we, that, that we use to fit our model. So it's telling you that um, you use being, you use me, you use this nonsensical stuff to actually um, software to actually predict that this is an autos um, you know, is in the autos category. And now it, does, it, it looks to me, looking at this, right, it doesn't it doesn't make sense to me that this are the text we used to actually come to this decision. Like it doesn't there's no link between it. Like I can't see anything like tires or um, carburetors or anything like or fandoms or wipers, right? So it doesn't it doesn't seem like this our model is doing a good job. Right? We can see it's like okay, it looks like everything is fine, it gets it's giving us high probabilities, um, you know, our F1 score is high, but this guy doesn't make any sense, right? This is we are auditing it. And because and the reason that is happening is we probably need to do some more. So this is the bugging. We probably need to do some more, you know, cleaning, some more extraction and all that and so on. So Lime is guiding you towards a place where you have more reliability in your model. Because just looking at this, it's telling me this doesn't make sense, right? If I try another method, if I try another instance, let's see what it does with another instance. Um, let's try instance 82. So it's telling us instance 82 is um, electronics, right? Because it's telling me that the probability that it's actually auto is 0 0.2, so it's very low. So I do this. <coughs> Change this. So the true class is electronics, right? Um, I do this again. So it's using car, engine, cars. You see that it doesn't actually. It doesn't make sense, right? Your your probability will be high. Your F1 score will be high, but it is actually not using the right features, and that would give you an indication like, oh, maybe I need to actually work on you know my feature. Um, Engineering and all the feature extraction and all that type of stuff. Um, yep, let me just run through this because I just want to show. So you see this. So it is telling you that if you take out, um, if you take out this guy, the probability will start moving on to. Okay, actually it makes sense. Actually, this makes sense because it's telling you that the true class. Is actually electronics, right? The true class is electronics, right? But it is telling you now that it's using car, engine, cars, autos, and all that kind of stuff. So it's telling you that if you take out cars, engine, and all these things, it start moving. The probability will start moving more to the other class, which you really don't care about. And that will show you here. So this actually looks like, so it, it predicted electronics at 0 0.78, right? So it is actually getting the right things here because this document, reading through it quickly, actually does seem like it is an electronic and also an auto one. Because it has, a, it has something called light here. Uh, car, car, change, car, oil. For me, this is actually more auto than electronics, right? Do you, do you see what I mean? If you look at the document, it looks like this should be an auto stuff. So you now see that, oh my god, it looks like, okay, my, my model seems to be performing globally very well, but for that particular instance, it's not picking on the right things. It's an indication that you might need to do some more work on the feature instruction, right? Um, so yes, this, this, is, this is the introduction to um, interpretability. There is a lot to cover. This is, I managed to, um, you know, basically squeeze everything into one hour. But the best resource, I think, would help you if you're trying to do this is this book by a guy called and also this uh, line paper. I'll send I'll send these things out to anyone. So the internet is not working anymore. It's a shame. Anyway, but there's a book called Interpretable uh, Machine Learning Models. And I think it is very useful to know how to build interpretable models into the future because people are going to start demanding that. Um, like you can't just build models 
and you think, oh, I'm this scientist, believe my word, my model will work right. You have to be able to explain to people why it works, right? So um, I think the takeaway for people should be, you know, go home, this is to motivate what Lime can do, what all the surrogate methods can do, and then, you know, take it from there. And maybe next time you'll be sitting here teaching us, um, you know, things we need to know and new methods that, that are in the industry. So thank you very much for listening, even if half of you got not. Uh,